I'd like to welcome everybody to the Reading is More Than Phonics workshop. Um, before we begin and hear from our presenters, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of housekeeping information. Um, you may use the chat feature to send messages to our host. So if you have questions that you would like us to include in the Q&A, um, please do that. And also to let you know that the session will be recorded. So I wanna welcome everyone. Um, this workshop is hosted by the School of Education at VCU. Uh, my name is Lisa Cipolletti. I am a faculty member in the School of Education and also serve as the Ruth Harris Fellow. And this workshop is made possible by the Ruth Harris Professorship. Um, Dr. Liu and Ruth Harris were committed to supporting the needs of school children, dyslexia, and the professionals who support them. So I would like to begin um, by introducing our speakers for this evening, who are the authors of Sortigories. Uh, Cheryl Perlito holds an education specialist degree in school administration with a focus on curriculum and leadership with 30 years of experience as a special education teacher and administrator. She was a contributing writer for language, third edition, and a contributing developer for Language Live with Dr. Louisa Motes. Nancy Chapel Eberhardt is an editorial board member of the International Dyslexia Association's Perspectives on Language and Literacy. She is a co-author of Language, the Comprehensive Literacy Curriculum, and a co-author of the Literacy How Professional Learning Series. In addition, she is a board member of the Reading League Connecticut chapter. Um, so thank you again uh, to our pre presenters for the evening, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Here we go. Let me just have to get to where I can see what I need here. Well, yeah. I can't. <laughs> this is the best laid plans here. There we go. I found it. There we go. Welcome to Reading is More Than Phonics. Thank you for that really nice introduction. Thank you to VCU um, for sponsoring this event. Our agenda is why do we say that reading is more than phonics? Well, you're gonna learn in a few minutes that the science of reading gets kind of a bad rap that it's all about phonics. And so we'll dig into that a little bit. What should we include beyond phonics and why? We'll talk about that. And then we'll look at sortigories as a model of a multi-component literacy instruction that even without sortigories, you can take away and use this with other products in your classroom or perhaps in your home. Okay. So what should we include beyond phonics and why? And I think I'd like to actually start with the and why and go backwards <clears throat> and for those of us who have been in the field of literacy instruction for uh, a number of years, and the, and the and even for those who are more recently involved, we have the absolute luxury um, and benefit of a vast amount of neuroscience that is now literally showing us what's going on inside our brains when we are reading, and that new information over the last couple of decades that's been amassing is uh, showing us that in order to actually develop that reading circuit, which is something we do have to develop, it's not a natural thing for us to read the way it is for us to most of us to learn to speak. We have to connect some areas in our brains and to do that, we need to work on these five aspects that we need to retrieve the letter patterns that's referred to as the orthographic knowledge, the connections to their sounds, which is that phonological piece. And those two pieces are what we generally think of or are included in phonics. 
But, and here's the critical point, that to access the meaning of the words, meaning that semantic knowledge, roots and affixes, that morphological information, and the function of words, that is what role is a word playing in a sentence or when we put words together, those have to also be connected in this reading circuit. So for that reason, we cannot be satisfied to just focus on the orthographic and phonological. We have to go beyond that. So um, with that, Mark Seidenberg said this a little more succinctly uh, when he said that practice, and I would add here instruction that links together the multiple dimensions of words, the sounds, the meanings, the functions, can facilitate the development of that reorganization and automaticity that needs to be going on to build the reading circuit. There was a wonderful article that I would turn your attention to in the journal, um, in the Reading League Journal back in June of 2022 by uh, Melissa Orkin and colleagues, where they talked about this word knowledge um, network, basically, and actually that's what Cheryl and I have come to call it, which is that the automatic recognition of all five components um, results in the simultaneous and effortless retrieval of accurate pronunciation, word meaning, and parts of speech during reading. And when we talk about reading uh, and comprehending and reading with fluency, it really means doing all of that together, not just speed, but making all of those uh, important connections. So as I just said, Cheryl and I over the last uh, few years have been uh, working to um, uh, represent um, to bring back um, a product that we worked on called Sortigories. And what we, as we got back to work on this after a hiatus of uh, 20 years, um, we wanted to create a framework that helped explain what we were trying to do with all of the activities. And to do that, we created <clears throat> this visual called the word, what we're calling the Word Knowledge Network. And it outlines around this, um, this circle, uh, the areas that I just talked about in sort of more common terms, phonology, sound symbol. We have kept syllables in this model because we want children and our teachers to have um, as part of instruction, focusing on syllable units as soon as possible <clears throat> in order to have students reading longer words as soon as possible. Um, but lest I digress, uh, we go on to semantics, um, the meanings, morphology, those meaning parts, we can change up a base. And then we have syntax, which is what happens when we arrange. So let's see what this looks like uh, with an example word. If I said the sounds or say the sounds k -a -s we would be at that phonological level. And I've represented you're hearing the sounds by the slash marks. Um, many of you I'm sure are familiar with that uh, way of representing sounds. But when I then assign a letter or letters to represent the sounds, we are going from sound to symbol. And it's that part that we talk about, uh, as I said earlier, as phonics. And then, when we go to uh, syllables, we now, when we say that word, when we've orthographically mapped it, we also have mapped what is a syllable and that can become part of a larger word like the word cast away or cast off. It's part of something larger and we don't have to go back to the individual letter sound associations to figure it out. We see it as a, as a unit. That's what orthographically mapped would mean. But that's only part of the story going back to that earlier slide. We also want to talk about meaning. And often, even with these little words, they have multiple meanings. For example, cast could be the group of people who put on a play or a movie. Cast can be a, a kind of bandage, a stiff bandage we put around a broken bone to help it heal. Um, Cast can be an action um, if I'm going to cast my fishing line to go fishing. So the, the point is, 
these little words don't have a singular meaning very often. And so part of our instruction in order to lead to comprehension when reading is to help children and or adults, uh, depending on when they're learning to read, to understand and, and expect that words can have more than one meaning and that's part of what our instruction needs to include. Then we can change um, the meaning of a word in a variety of ways when we move to morphology. Now the word cast by itself is a meaning carrying unit, it's a base word, but we could add ing to say uh, the, the um, producer was casting for the movie, meaning putting a cast together, or we could say, um, casts, meaning um, she had three casts after a terrible accident. So you can just imagine what someone looked like. But the point of it is, is by adding endings, we can impact the meaning of those single words. And then last but not least is syntax. And this becomes really where the meaning uh, comes together because until we put a word into at least a phrase, maybe a clause, perhaps a sentence, um, we really won't know what meaning we are intending. And so um, I, we have to keep in mind that getting to text, getting into some kind of connected text is essential for building uh, that reading circuit. And while I've gone around this circle in a clockwise direction, um, what I'm really also suggesting and what the graphic is suggesting is that this process also works in reverse. And we know from uh, other research um, that words that children or adults have in their listening vocabulary actually improves the speed of recognizing a word that they're sounding out. I use as an example, if I said, we've all seen children who will go, ab, ab, and they may say it over and over, the sounds are perfect, everything's going great, but they don't blend it together and uh, come up with a word as a unit. And often that's a result of simply not recognizing what they're hearing when they're trying to blend. So this, this directionality of building this network really goes in both in both directions. Now, in the work that Cheryl and I have done, we have tried to build um, a practice tool, which we're going to use as an example tonight. Um, and we have activities for each of the points around this network. But what I also, for those of you who are familiar with um, Scarborough's Reading Rope, I think it's really important to also kind of superimpose on this network that we are dealing with both parts of the rope. We're dealing with word recognition by these things that I've, are at the top of our network. And we're also dealing with aspects of learning to read that are language comprehension, the semantics, morphology, and syntax. And in just the same way that we were describing that the brain needs to connect all these parts, I think it's beautifully represented by the way all these strands of the rope need to come together. So with that, I think we're gonna make a transition here. I'm gonna try anyway, I'm gonna stop sharing. And perhaps if there's a question of what we've talked about so far, we could talk while Cheryl's switching over here. I do believe the only question that was asked that I would like to ask you is, are these slides available to other individuals to use in their practice? Hmm. Typically just the recording. We don't usually give the slides away, um, but the recording would have the slides on it, of course. Yes. And this recording will be available um, on the Ruth Harris Professorship website. Thanks for the thanks for the question. So, um, as Lisa said earlier in in the introductions, I had the pleasure of writing um, with Louisa Modes for Language Live, and also had the pleasure of her reviewing sortigories for us. And the point of sharing this quote from her her, her response is tying it into the word knowledge network that um, Nancy just talked about. Let's give this a listen. 
Nancy, it's just so great the way you and Cheryl have integrated these layers of language into all of these activities. So it's just so much more than basic decoding. And that's exactly what we've always needed, not to have this artificial separation um, among the aspects of language that kids need to know. And it's just so beautiful what you've done. Oh, thank you, Louisa. As you so when we hear those words from Dr. Mose, many of you, she needs no introduction for many of us. Um, she would agree that phonics is important, but we need more than phonics. So let's take a look at some examples. And she's just so sorry. Okay. So first, in order to understand what you are, have in your instruction, it's really important to have a really solid scope and sequence. Um, the QR code on the left is the scope and sequence specific to sortigories levels A and B, and it really does go from sound to syntax that's represented on the Word Knowledge Network. Reading Rockets is a great resource to talk through what is important about scope and sequence, why is scope, what is scope and sequence, why is it important, that's the larger um, QR code on the right side. Um, and sortigories, scope and sequence from sound to syntax, more than just phonics, is featured on Reading Rockets, which we're really proud of. But there's no single perfect scope and sequence. It's important to know that. What's important about scope and sequence is that it's systematic, sequential, and cumulative. So that is very important. You can't introduce it, leave it, and not uh, revisit it, okay? So we think about scope and sequence in terms of sounds, the letters that represent those sounds on the bottom row, then the words that we can build with those sounds and letters, then that moves to phrases that we can build with those words and eventually sentences and paragraphs. So we are moving from sound to text. When we're talking about the systematic, sequential, cumulative scope and sequence. So all of our activities are based on a scope and sequence that I just described, but it's based on it in um, this grid of nine activities. So in sortigories, the first row are the foundational skills. We said reading is more than phonics, but we're not gonna skip it. That's in our first row. Then we take phonics to vocabulary in the second row, but all the scope and sequence from the first row is carried through on word meaning in the second row. Similarly, we get to usage with morphology, grammar, and grammar is with an eye on comprehension, not necessarily what is a noun, phrase building, and then that grows up to sentence fluency. So we move from sound to syntax so that we do start with those foundational skills, but we take it right to syntax or connected text. So when you think about the range of practice, decodable words are words that all the sounds and letters have been taught and those words then can be read or are decodable for that student based on the scope and sequence. So we have context, out of context practice, which is important. We can see on the left-hand side, um, just a list of words you would match with the pictures. Then we have in context practice with decodable text, an example from our friends at Whole Phonics. But what comes in the middle? And in some cases, what's missing? Nancy mentioned sometimes we have students who might be able to read map, but they can't say it faster. And they're just stuck on that sound by sound reading. What's missing in the middle of that out of context practice and in context practice is practice, lots of practice with the scope and sequence. And that's what we're trying to illustrate here. So when we look at level A, we know that the first row in sortigories is decoding and encoding. So decoding is the phonics portion, encoding is the spelling portion. If you have students that are having trouble um, carrying over maybe what they learn from one day to the next, maybe beef up that encoding piece, having kids spell the words, phoneme graphing mapping for the words that they've been reading, because that will help complete the reading circuit for them. Then making sure that you take it to meaning. What do those words mean that they just um, wrote and spelled? then how do we use that word in context? What happens when we add an ending? What happens when we change its function? What happens when we put it in a phrase? If the phrase is in the park, do you know that that answer is when? So that is all very important. 
The types of practice that our students get is also very important. In the first row, it's called blocked practice. Blocked practice is when you have the same type of practice over and over in isolation, so you're learning a brand new skill. Interleave practice is when you take a skill, like from the first row, and you interleave it to the second row, and in this case, also the third row, it actually helps commit the first row to memory and automatic retrieval and use it in a novel situation, like what does the word mean? All, some students have trouble getting to generalization. Generalization is what is necessary to move to mastery, meaning like riding a bike, that flow state that you can't unlearn it once you see it. Most of us, we see categorize it in the middle of the page. We can't unread it. We just read it so fast because we've generalized how to read this decodable word. So generalization is what helps, helps us get to mastery. All of this is important types of practice that is necessary to build reading fluency and reading comprehension. In level B, we change things up a little bit. Sound match um, it advances to what sounds are the same in a word. Build it advances to um, building words in syllables, not just individual sounds. And phrase building grows up to sentence fluency. We're gonna show you examples of all three of those. Let's start with a demonstration of map it. Categories. Level A. Map it. Map it focuses on the segmentation deletion, and substitution of sounds in words. In the first yeah. task of Map It, identify or segment each sound in a word. In the second task, remove or delete a sound to change a word. In the third task, change or manipulate a sound to create a new word. Click here to see how the heart lets you know the part that is tricky. Before you try it, click here to see an example. The word is his. So in this case, the word is his. Before I show you this activity, I wanna first say that all of these are available as triads on our website. So you can try these as well at home. But if I'm doing his, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna think about the sounds in his. His and then hit submit. His. Is. His. The word is flag. So in flag, at first you hear a blend, so the inside sound is easy to miss. So I might get that one wrong. Oops. Click try again. Mm -hmm. The word is flag. Let me try. Uh, 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 Not quite. Oh, dear. Flag has four sounds spelled with four letters. F, L, A, G. Flag. So shows me the right answer. Perfect. The word is was. Was. Hmm. I think my teacher told me that was a heart word. So with heart words, if the, there's a yellow heart, it's not yet decodable. I'm going to learn that sound later. But if it's a red heart, we have to remember the tricky part of the word. Let's listen to was. The letter A spells a uh in what. Oh, so I have to remember the letter A, but I can sound the rest of it out. So it would be what. I have to remember the A and what was. Was. Uh, ah, and there's the red heart. Was. Remind me to remember that part. The word is print. Print. So I have an initial blend, er, it, and a final blend. N -t. Print. Print. P er, it, n -t. 
print. Oh, and here's my reward. The cat comes in. The word later. is the hands. Cat. The word is hands. So now I'm into deletion. Notice that we changed. So I'm going to build hands. 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 Change hands to hand. So this is an advanced task for students. We're actually going to manipulate something by deleting. I have to take a sound away. Hands without the z is hand. Change hand to and. Think about that, folks at home. How would you change hand to and? Which block would you delete? Hand without the is and. Change and to and. And to and. And without the d is and. Change dig to big. So this is the most difficult when we're going to manipulate it. Change dig to big. So I have to choose the part that's going to change. That's right. Change d in dig to b big. Change big to bag. Now the middle the vowel sound is going to change. That's right. Change. Okay. So we're going to keep going. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. We can get back. about that. Okay. Doesn't help your retrieval. This was your quick review. <laughs> okay. Okay, and this is build it. This is going to show a quick little video on how build, to build set. It. Change set to fat. So we're leaving phonemic awareness and going into phonics. Change fat to cat. And now on this one, this is another demonstration. We're getting into sound match for level B. I'm gonna click through this just to get us through it a little bit faster. In sound match, the focus is on sound to spelling associations. In the first match, the focus is on where the sound is the same in two spoken words. The second match is between the spoken sound and a letter or letters that are used to spell the sound. Before you try it, click here to see an example. When you are ready, click try it. Home, cope. Where is the sound the same in home and cope? So the idea here is to say home, cope. But I do want to show you real quick that there's a Select help. a tile for help. And if I need help with any of the vowel sounds, which I won't do now for the sake of time, I can click on any of those vowel sounds to get help. But I know that the sound is the same here. There's a um, stopwatch here. So if I wait too long, then I will, might get correct points for being um, accurate, but not automatic. O is the same in home and cope. The letter O with a final silent E spells O. So if you need help with final silent E, you can get it up here. Huge question mark. cage. Where is the sound? The this is a building word building by syllable in level B, showing how level A grows up. I'm going to click through this to get through it. In level B, I'm going to click through that just to get through it. Build, Two. inhale. So I can build now by syllable. Inhale. If I have questions about building by syllables, I can get information. Select an option. Menu. Vowel sounds. What is a syllable? Syllable meanings. 
longer words. So I, this is where I can go for help. I can go for help as a teacher, as a parent, or as a student. So what was my build, build, inhale, inhale. So I can build my word inhale, hit submit. In, hail, inhale. Notice how those syllables come together to make a word inhale. Change inhale to exhale. Hmm, inhale. What part of my word changed? Exhale. Exhale. That gives you an idea of how that um, particular activity grows up from level A to level B. We're going to pause here for questions if there are any. Any questions? Then we'll I don't believe I have any questions regarding the content specifically, um, but I ask that anyone who has any questions regarding the content, please type them into the chat and we will answer them at the Q&A at the end or during one of our transitions. Thank you, Sabrina. I'm doing the same thing Cheryl's doing because it's really the <laughs> safest way for us to do this. <laughs> Uh, it's not the fastest, but it's the safest. Um, so what Cheryl was just illustrating are ways that we can work on that first row where we're working basically on phonics. But once we have the knowledge of the sound of spelling correspondences to read words that are decodable using that, uh, we can now move into vocabulary. And one of the activities that helps students move into the semantic area is this one called Categorize It. And I thought I would show you this um, and how it, the whole activity works. First, an important question, dogs or cats? So in our product, uh, Sortigories, um, we have a motivator throughout um, and we have to choose a dog or cat to make this work. So I'm going to choose a dog. First, select the audio icons to listen to each category, animals, names, and neither. Then, drag the words that appear here to the correct category. At any time, you may move words from one category to another. When no more words appear, click Submit to check your answer. You can use this icon at the top to view an example or use the glossary icon to see pictures and meanings for the words in this activity. For example, drag the first word to the correct category and drop it. Now do the same for the second word. At any time, you can move words from one category to another. Repeat until no more words appear. <laughs> Click Submit to check your answer. Words in the correct category will appear in blue. Words in red are not in the correct category. Don't worry, you'll have a second try to get as many words correct as you can. Now it's your turn. Put each word in the correct category. So I'm actually going to do this activity, but before I do, um, once users know how the activity works, there's a way to skip through that instruction. You don't have to listen to that over and over again. Um, the words that are in the little tile are decodable based on the scope and sequence. Any words like the category headings that are not decodable, we have an icon, uh, the microphone to say the word. So um, those are important details that are apply across activities. Um, so I'm going to do this activity. I'm going to make a couple mistakes um, on purpose to make a point in a few minutes. So I'm you. We would have our students reading these words out loud, ideally, so that we're practicing um, going from print to speech. Um, and let's see, man. Okay, so I've done all the words. I'm going to submit my answer. Good try. Words in blue are in the right category. Try again with the words in red. Now, before I try again, I've made a mistake with these. I've obviously, I don't know something about the word. So I can come up and use the glossary, which is- Select like the word to see and hear the definition. So I put this in animals because I thought it was cats. Uh, let me cats, see. a stiff bandage for a broken bone. Okay, and then I put 
mat in the names because I thought mat. it was. A small piece of carpet for the floor. And then mat. There's the, the other name. name. And so on. So the glossary is designed to help um, provide that semantic layer of knowledge that some students will need. And in some cases, it might be desirable before students do the sort to actually go through the glossary and, and talk about the meanings of the words. This is not a gotcha game. Um, it's really to help the students learn the meaning. So now that I've uh, straightened out this meaning, this is not cats, it's cast. So I'm going to move it over here. And then this is the wrong kind of mat. And cab is not an animal. I mean, it's not a name. Now I hit submit. Great job. All 10 words are correct. Wonderful. You earned a ribbon. And ribbons are awarded for mastery level performance, uh, 10, 9, or 80, uh, down to 80%. Click a pet to feed it. When you are done, click continue. Now, if, if there's a con connection between attention to task and engagement, we think that getting to feed the animals uh, builds that engagement factor. Um, so we can either feed one dog at a time or in the interest of time, all of them. And then last but not least- Here are your results. We have a printable results screen that also uh, for the, if the student prints it, the teacher would see the reward, the ribbon and mastery level performance. Thank you. For every 10,000 points scored on categories, we will make a donation to feed rescue animals. The more points you earn, the more we can help together. And that Click is our goal. To try again. So that is a complete activity. Note the relationship between that row one decoding, though, and what we're doing to practice the semantic level here um, and uh, categorize it. Um, we also are interested in challenging students. So we have uh, built an activity called analogy building. And with this, the words that are used to solve the analogy are decodable. So let's just see a quick example. Cut is to bandage as break is to... Oops, click try again. Cut is to bandage, as break is to... We're using a hint. A cut is covered by a bandage. Correct. Cut is to bandage, as break is to cast. And one of the other things we were striving for um, in these activities is to really develop the oral language around using these words and think of how much conversation could go on um, with, with that activity. Then, um, as we were saying earlier, we want to get into context. So we have um, a little demo here, not a demo, a little video of, of phrase building where Students are going to build a phrase using words that they can decode. So this build is the fat cat. And then once they have built the fat cat, we want us to um, have the students identify what information is that telling us. So we have part two. What question does this phrase answer in the following sentence? The fat cat climbed slowly up the tree. And so what we're trying to do now is move beyond the single word meaning to now what is the meaning um, of a phrase. And then as we move to, as Cheryl said, move to level B, We've taken this up a notch um, to uh, uh, called an activity called sentence fluency. And let's take a, a look at this. In sentence, I'm going to move along a little more word quickly. What phrase answers did what? Now in this activity, again, we're we're teaching incrementally how to get from word by word reading to reading with. Uh, phrase recognition to phrase 
units, phrase boundaries. And in sentence fluency, we're showing the students where those units are within a sentence by underlining them. Then we're asking them which of those words or phrases is answering the question, did what? We have a help for this. What if I select don't- Select a question. Don't know what question did what is, what we're answering with did what? And here we have an answer. Did what? Did what? Tell us the action, the thing, or object did. The dog ran. Did what? It ran. And one of the things that we are learning through our talk with teachers is part of the reason they don't feel comfortable uh, working on some of these skills is they don't have the language to teach it and talk about it. So what we're trying to do is break this down and make that possible. But so what word or phrase answers did what? And the answer would be makes nests. What word or phrase answers where? And if I read each phrase, I'd come up with the blog. What word or phrase answers what did it? And again, anytime I'm not sure, I could check the help, but it's some reptiles. And once we've done that, read the sentences. Then click on a tile that tells who or what the three sentences are about. And what we're striving for here is that when we have students identifying who and what um, in a sentence or just sorting words that way, that's really to help them be able ultimately to identify what they're reading about, what the topic is. And we have, again, select an option. multiple help options here. And again, in the interest of time, I won't show that. Um, but the idea is Read that- Read the sentences, then click on a tile that tells who or what the three sentences are about. And then once we do that, we see that the words are highlighted. And our goal is for students to be able to apply not only their decoding, because these are decodable sentences based on the scope and sequence of, of phonics, but it's also uh, building up using that syntactic knowledge that they've been working on. Now, it's very important, uh, we think, to also say that this kind of uh, multi-component approach is not limited to using sortigories by any stretch. In fact, uh, we encourage uh, teachers that when students are reading their decodable text, again, text that com is composed of the words that they have the code to be able to read, we can be using the same kind of thinking. So I could be asking um, in, in this activity after reading, but then the sun dims, the thick fog sets in on the path. Um, we, could, we could ask which word is a kind of weather, that kind of uh, semantic categorization. And hopefully you're thinking the answer would be fog and we'd want them to read that and, or point to that word. Um, which word is an antonym for a thin? So now we're thinking of a word relationship. And again, we hope they would come up with the word thick, but we can use this text and go beyond just reading the words accurately to doing some work on semantics. Um, we can also, in morphology, there are several words that have an S on them, and often S means plural. Does that mean plural on dims or sets, um, the S on those two words? And hopefully you're saying no, it has a different function in, in this situation. Um, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. Um, and then the other is, is the word sun, uh, are the words sun and path um, meaning one? or more than one? And how would you know that? And this are these are questions that you can be asking using the decodable text. You don't necessarily need a program to work on that. And then we can also work on syntax, some of the kinds of questions we were just seeing. What did the sun do? And hopefully you would say the sun dims. Dims is the answer. What said in? I hope the thick fog would be the answer and what phrase tells where and hopefully they would answer on the path. All of these questions um, and all of this, these activities are designed to have students 
practice working with the words that they can decode in as many different ways as we can to read and reread and to practice. So Cheryl. Can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Okay. So what are we trying to achieve according to Kern? Simple rules, simple patterns, and massive amounts of practice. It's the practice that really is getting missed. And it's the practice that will take kids from slow labored reading that might sound like a robot to fluent readers. So on our website as parents and as teachers, um, professionals, educators, students, might be a little bit scary kind of the science of reading world and not to know like who do you trust how do you know what products is good um and are they aligned with the science of reading one thing to look for is to look for products that have an sr rating sortigories for example has an sl level four rating we look to getting um less uh, sl level three to one um, as we do more research involving students also uh, we're aligned on the alignment with ufly um, Alaska Reads has us on their approved list, Reading Rockets has us on their website, and Iowa uh, Reading Research Center has really good resources, specific, lots of really good resources, including those for parents. So those are some trusted resources that we have on our website. Um, we're going to be doing a presentation for Patton. Um, they're excellent. Anytime you can find anything from IDA, if you have students with dyslexia or um, really all kids, to be honest. And then the Reading League Compass will help um, school districts understand more about English learners or any category of information that you need to learn about. Um, the Reading League Compass is something new. In addition to the Reading Universe, these are all really great trusted resources. The Reading League Compass and Reading um, Universe is really great um, for professional learning from your school district. So very good. I also want to encourage you to check us out on our website um, in the upper right hand corner is the QR code for that. You can contact us at Cheryl at Sortigories.com or Nancy at Sortigories.com. If you contact us in any way, um, whether it's through the QR code or via email, we're happy to send you a um, code to get the first month off of Sortigories. It would be like the first month free and we'd be happy for you to try Sortigories. There's another way to try Sortigories, which is on our website, which is the, um, the QR code in the upper right-hand corner. At the top of the page, there's different toolbars. If you click Try It, that's what Nancy and I did with you today. We did many of the Try It buttons right from our website. So you could try those at home or in school with your students as well. I don't know if there's another slide. I think we might be all set. Yep, very good. So maybe if we unshare and pause for any additional questions that there might be.